and welcome to the Two Robbies podcast, your destination for in-depth discussion and analysis of the Premier League. I'm Robbie Earl. He's Danny Higginbottom, my special guest for the day. No must oh this weekend. And here are today's topics. What's happening at Manchester United after their nil-nil draw against Villa? Who are true champion contenders after the first two months of this season? Which teams will escape relegation? And who might go down? And what are the sort of biggest surprises so far this season? So, with the international break coming up, Dan, we're just going to take sort of a general look back over the table. Seven games played now. We, we go to the international break. We have to start with, with um, Manchester United. It's been the story from midweek, really, that 3-3 draw in, 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 um, in Europe uh, at Porto. Eric Ten Hag supposedly under some pressure. All the big wigs were there from Manchester United's point of view. There was some talk in the media, a bad defeat to Villa, and he could lose his job. So what's your what's your, your takeaway from what you saw today, Dan? And is there room for optimism? Or yeah, was the nil-nil draw kind of symptomatic of a Manchester United team that sit 14th in the league and have scored only five Premier League goals so far this season? I, I think the latter, Robbie. I think that, you know, it is it is rinse and repeat for this team. And I think it has been for so long. And you look at it and it's like, when does it become the fact that it's not actually the manager to blame all the time? Because they've yeah. had some top-class managers. They've had a lot of different managers. Um, but it was obvious. I think they went there to, to Aston Villa today to defend as well as they could and hopefully get a couple of chances on the counter-attack. And I think, I think the problem that you have from a game like today, if you're Ten Hag, the ownership are going to be looking at the two clubs. Yeah. And when you look at the, the situation with Emery, he took over, I think, six months after Ten Hag. And look what he's done, mm. how he's, you know, changed the fortunes of that team, got them into the Champions League on very, very little money compared to what Ten Hag spent. I think the simple fact a lot of Ten Hag signings were on the bench, not really seeing an identity at the moment. Um, I'm not seeing a style of football that suits the players. But this is a conversation, Robbie, that you and me could probably have had two years ago, <laughs> yeah. three years ago. Yeah. But it's it's the same thing. So it, mm. it has to be a lot deeper than just bringing in a new manager and that will solve things. Because United have had some world-class managers yeah. since Sir Alex Ferguson left. And they've not been able to fix the problem. It, it's like any manager comes in and they have that sort of little bit of a bounce. Mm. Maybe the first season... And then it just tails off and the ending has been seen by everybody so many times. Then I'll play devil's advocate because it, it seems, talking from the leadership group uh, led by Dan Ashworth and, and mm. Omar Barada, uh, Jason Wilcox, um, the, fo- the people around the football side of, of, of the business, there, there seemed to be a sense that there was calm. They weren't looking to, to rush to make a decision. They want to give him as much time. And, and I... I, I Heard a really interesting quote from it was Graham Potter, actually, on Monday Night Football on Sky, our partners in the UK. He, he was in this week. And he talked about his time at Brighton. And something really hit home to me, Dan, when he said, you know, I was set up for success at Brighton because behind the scenes, all the things were in place and everything was sort of functioning properly for me to be the manager and be successful. Now, to be fair to Eric Ten Hag, um, and listen, I've been critical at times. And listen, we, we're two and a half years in. And I still don't quite know the system. We've got a couple of cups. We, we have a couple of performances now and then, but there's no consistency. But to, for Ten Hag in, in sort of in his defence, could we say that structure behind the club hasn't been there? For a huge club like Manchester United, like the, the recruitment we've seen, the technical directors, the sporting directors, all those things that successful clubs seem to have, Manchester United are just now getting in place. And so... In some ways, doesn't Ten Hag deserve the chance to see if, with that setup, he can improve things? We can see that progression that you're talking about and the style of football maybe that is more linked to the, the style of football from when you were back in the day and Sir Alex Ferguson was around the football club. See, I, I do see that point, but I think that, you know, my own honest opinion, mm. the reason that Ten Hag is still at the club is because there was a lack of alternative that really stuck yeah. out. It should never you know, be a I reason think... you stay in a job, really, should it? Exactly. Ex- exactly. But I think, you know, from that side of things, he probably kept the job 
by default, if you go back five, six, seven years, yeah. there was always, you know, there's always a huge pool of managers that you looked at and thought, wow, you know what, they could do a job at X, Y, X, Y, and Z. Now, the only problem that you have, because you talk about now the leadership group, you talk about yeah. everything behind the scenes, and I agree 100%. If things aren't okay off the pitch, they're never going to be right on the pitch. And we've seen clubs the way they go about it. Manchester United were playing catch-up for so long. Even they were like seven, eight, nine, ten years yeah. behind some teams in terms of having a sporting director. Problem Manchester United have now, A, they're not going to attract the best players because the best players are going to have choices of probably four, five, or even six different teams around Europe that they could potentially go to instead yeah. of Manchester United. Secondly, and I think this is probably an even more important point. Each year that Manchester United are struggling, each year that Manchester United are becoming desperate, mm. you're paying overinflated prices for players that aren't necessarily worth anywhere near that amount. So all of a sudden, not only are you not able to get the top, top players, the players that the top teams don't want, mm. you're also then paying overinflated over prices in the hope that this player could change things for you. And... I think if you go back to when Manchester United were having all the success, I think Robin Van Persie was was a prime yeah. example because I think there was a lot of talk of him going to Manchester City. He mm, could probably have yeah. got more money. But he went to Manchester United because it was a team that, that were winning things and he was proven right. He ended up winning the Premier League there. So that's what I that's what I think makes it even more difficult as in terms of when you're trying to bring players in. You know, Manchester United were always looking for game changers. And unfortunately, they're paying game changer prices. Yeah, they're not getting game changer plays, and for me, that's a huge problem for them as well. When I look at the situation, Dan, and and, and I see Villa, you know, it was a nil nil draw today. Um, I thought a, a really important point for for Eric Ten Hag. It was so important they didn't lose. It was really more important they didn't lose badly because I think we would have been maybe talking about his job. They 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 scraped a, a nil nil. He, he, in his words, rotated Martinez and Delit and played Evans in, in Maguire. And in our language, mate, when we used to play, they were dropped. So, I, so I, I, I don't I don't, I don't, don't buy this rotation no. word. I mean, no. come on. Um, Not with centre-backs. Yeah. But, but my point, Danny, is looking at that squad of players, um, mm. and, and let's say, you know, you get... They're getting people back fit now. They're getting a number. I know some are not as much fit as you would like, but there's a decent group that's coming to get, uh, together now. Is this group good enough to to be to sort of match the ambitions of the club, or really are we talking about actually they aren't good enough players? When when you're talking about you know getting to the levels of, of being able to try and compete, going back to trying to win titles, we see Unai Emery work with a group of Aston Villa players, many who were part of Steven Gerrard's team, and and look completely different. Could somebody else come into Manchester United and get a different tune? Or are some of these players really not quite at the level that we thought? And maybe they've overpaid. You know, they've definitely overpaid for a number of players that mm. aren't able to get in the starting eleven now. But yeah. one of the things that, that you see with the top teams, you know, we're talking mm. we're talking about the Premier League. You look at Arsenal, you look at Liverpool, you look at Manchester City, you look at Aston Villa now, you look at yeah. Newcastle, you look at what Chelsea are starting to do. All of those teams I've just mentioned, they're a really strong collective. Yeah. My concern with Manchester United now for a long time is that when you watch them, they look like a team of individuals. Yeah. And, you know, Robbie, you played with some great players. But if you haven't got that collective spirit between you where you're you're willing and you're prepared to do something that's not necessarily to your benefit to help one of your teammates, yeah, then you're going to have huge problems. And I think when you look at Manchester United, a matter of, the amount of goals that they concede, they've conceded from set pieces, obviously mm. going back to last season as well, conceding the turnover of possession. And for me, that's a lack of that's a lack of leadership, a lack of communication, a lack of concentration, a lack of organization. So you can have all of these, all of these players, individuals that, that may be really good individuals, yeah. but you then have to make them a collective. What would be really interesting, there's no way to ever know this, but if you look at the players that Manchester United have signed. Imagine if some of them had gone to an Arsenal, yeah, a Liverpool, see, a Manchester yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. Would they be the players that mm. they are or, or would they be better players? Yeah. And I think a lot of them would end up being better players because they're going into 
a better environment. I think yeah. they're going into more of a collective squad where everybody's going to help each other. So I think whatever they're going to do, whether they end up keeping Ten Hag or, mm. you know, whether it is a new manager that, that eventually comes in, you've got to try and unite this group of players because a lot of the times players, there's some really talented players, but they yeah. look as though they're playing their own game instead of being invested in what should be an identity of, an, of a team. Yeah, it's a really interesting point, and, and, and I'll take it a little bit further because, mm. you know, look at Rasmus Hoyland today, and listen, we had the great Gary Neville with us, I think eight Premier League titles and Champions Leagues yeah. and 17 trophies, like incredible haul. And I was, you know, picking his brain as a game was going on with, with players, and, and we were talking about Hoyland, and, and I said, it must be so difficult for a young player signed into a football club and you're sort of pushed into Manchester United. We know he's young, he's had some injury problems, he's getting back to fitness. But there's no real structure, set way of playing, Dan. So it must be a nightmare. You know, as a young kid going in a team, when you know we were all starting off, you need a structure. You need a couple of people around you, helping you out and pushing you in the right places and making sure and encouraging you. I don't sense that this is quite the, the case at Manchester United. And, and another thing that, that came up, and I just want to get your thought before we maybe move on and a quick line on Villa and we'll move on, but... Me and Gary were talking, and, and, and we kind of hit on a point and said, do you know, with that first team squad, how many players in that squad are probably somewhat unhappy or unhinged, however you want to say it? Like Casemiro, obviously not happy. Anthony, not happy. Rashford, you know, dragged off at half-time, rotation again, you know, and plays today, and, 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 and you know, he, he makes... Uh, Delit, Martinez dropped today. Um, Ganacho probably feels he should be playing. You know, there's a lot of players with who should who probably not feeling great about themselves or great about the club at the moment. And again, I'm not sure that's a great collective to bring the spirit, to bring the togetherness. But everybody's almost fighting for their own shirt, really, and, and their own back. Do you know what I mean? It just it was interesting that when Gary said about it today. It kind of I started thinking, yeah, how, how many of those players are really happy at the moment? Well, I think, you know, the conversation that you and that you and Gary obviously had mm. about, you know, the way that players feel, you will have been at clubs where players are feeling exactly that way. I've yeah, been at clubs yeah. where players are feeling exactly that mm. way. But the difference was you had those leaders in the dressing room who would put their arm around them and say, listen, yeah. you know, this is how it this is how it is. This is how things are going to get better. These are the things you've got to deal with. You know, the prob the, the problem that you have at the moment at a club like Manchester United is that where are your senior figures? Because you know what it's like, Ruby. Yeah. Not even the best teams, but the teams that are successful, whatever whatever success is to them, mm. the, tra the, the changing room is so strong. The changing yeah. room can take care of itself. If the manager had a problem sometimes with a player, the manager didn't have to sort it out. The players mm. could sort it out. And, you know, you go back to Manchester United, you go back to that class of 92. It was unbelievable. Mm. But the reason they were able to be successful is that they went into a team that had so many players that were comfortable in their own skinners in terms of their own performances. Yeah. And they were able to help the younger players. I remember making, I only played maybe five or six times for them, but I remember making my um, my Premier League debut. And in front of me, I had Roy Keane. To the right of me, I had Yap Stam. Um, <laughs> I think Paul Scholes was playing. And every yeah, time when yeah. I got the ball, they would all make movements for me to make my life really easy. Yeah. Whereas I think what we is happening so often now how many times have we heard oh Manu's going to be the saviour or Ganacho is going to be the yeah. saviour relying These on young individuals kids. yeah yeah, yeah and, and they're young kids and mm. all of a sudden you're expecting them to be leaders in what is a, a, a team that is on a rough rough patch for a long yeah. time when young players come in and be successful more often than not it's not the way that Ganacho and Manu have been successful yeah. it's coming in and playing alongside your leaders if you look at Manchester United the Brian Robsons the Roy Keynes mm. the Gary Nevilles yeah. you know the Yap Stams but they're actually being asked to come into this team and make this change this team from like 7th or 8th place team yeah. to a 4th place team you want younger players coming into a team that's already on its way to being that so therefore mm. pressure that you're putting on young players is it's very, very tough. And the last thing I'll say on this, and it's something that I've always thought about Manchester United, if you look at the young players that come through yeah. at that club, they're the ones that when they go and play for the first team, they look the most comfortable as in mm. terms of the mentality because they've been brought up in that atmosphere. Yeah. Whereas I think some players come from other clubs and it's like, wow, this is great, this is Manchester United. All of a sudden, 
that shirt becomes very, very heavy for certain players. And yeah. I think that is the case. I think that's the case for some players at the moment. And that's not going to enable you to get mm. back to where you want to be. Well, it wasn't a great game, um, but a, I would say a great point for Eric Ten Hag and a clean sheet uh, to boot. So um, at least he rests a little bit easier over, over the, the next couple of weeks' international break. Just a word on Villa. I thought it was a bit of a game after the Lord's Mayor's show, the, the midweek game against Bayern Munich. Unai Emery had said he, he, he was going to guard against that. Players would be ready. But I just think the emotion and the physicality and that, they, they never quite got going, Villa. And... You know, I suppose it's a credit to them. You'd have to say they probably disappointed not to beat Manchester United at home today. Um, Conta got a bit of an injury, which is a shame for him. I think he'll be out of the England squad now. Um, there was one or two players not available. Uh, Ross Barkley got a start in, in midfield. Um, and uh, Bailey came in on the right-hand side for Ramsey. So they weren't quite at the best, Phil. I don't think it was, it was their best day. But listen, they sit fifth in the table, 14 points, and, and ticking along very nicely. Two wins in Champions League, so... Um, maybe a little contrast between the two teams and the two managers with expectations at both those clubs. All right, mate, I'm going to move it on to the, the top three and we're just going to have a, a, you know, a, a couple of minutes on, on each of the top three teams in terms of if we feel that the, the title winners are going to come from the likes of Liverpool, Manchester City or Arsenal. Tell me where you are with Liverpool. Sitting top of the table, 18 points, 1-0 win against Palace. Probably should have been more... Um, had enough chances, uh, certainly in the first half. Jota had a couple, I can remember, that you know would have made it uh, uh, different. I kind of feel like there's more to come from uh, from um, Liverpool, but listen, sitting top of the table, 18 points on a slot, you know, uh, in, in his first start with, with Liverpool's, kind of in a pretty good place. Yeah, they, they are. And I think he was in a unique situation as well, because a lot of the times when you take over mm. a football club, it's because things haven't been going right for the previous manager. Yeah. But I also then, because I've spoke to managers, not necessarily at that level, but I've spoke to managers before that come into a club and they're succeeding someone who's had success. Yeah. And the hardest thing to do is to continue mm. with what made that team successful because yeah. you want to put your own imprint on it. And that can be the toughest thing. And I, I don't think he's changed too much. No. But what I do think he's done is just given them a little bit more of defensive solidity. You know, mm. he seems to always have two of the three midfielders sitting at all yeah. time. That's, that allows the fullbacks mm. to go forward. And they, they've they got this really good blend, this really good balance. And I know that we've spoken about it before. The interesting thing is what happens this season is in terms of the contracts. Yeah. We know with Salah, with Van Dijk, with Trent mm. Alexander-Arnold, because that could, have a, that could have a huge part to play in what happens with the team. Do I think that they will challenge Arsenal or Manchester City long-term over this season? Mm. I don't. I think they've had an incredible start. Yeah. But I still think, you know, with the changing of the management, I still do think that Manchester City and Arsenal now probably just that next step up. And I think whoever finishes ahead of a Manchester City or an Arsenal wins the league. Yeah. Um, but I think Liverpool fans can be very, very content as in terms of the manager coming in. Mm. And there's not really been drop, if that makes sense. It's a little bit yeah. different style. Yeah. But if you're a Liverpool fan, I think I think you're very happy. Would you mm. would you Agree with yeah, that. Yeah, uh, and, and it was interesting. You know, Liverpool didn't spend any money in the summer. There was a lot of talk like, mm. oh, you know, are we going to go behind? A couple of, uh, I re I've been sort of doing a little bit of on slot research this week. Just want to get a bit of sense, a bit more. We had a couple of interesting things, like where he is working with individuals as well as groups. He's man management. And, and I always thought that, you know, visually and, and a few rumours you hear around Liverpool, as though there were times that, you know, that great personality that, that Jurgen Klopp was... Maybe you can start to butt heads. Maybe after seven, eight years of, of, of the same thing, it, it just wears a little bit. And I just wondered whether, like, a Nunes, a, a Trent Alexander-Arnold, Van Dijk, Salah, have just got a different man management style with Slot. He looks like he, he's in charge. Apparently he can raise his voice when he has to and, and get his point across. I heard he, they, they, they're doing breathing exercises before the games to get them ready. He's doing ice baths and yoga and hydrotherapy. You know, so he's... He's stimulating the players in a different way and sometimes that's almost like a new player. You know, everything just becomes a bit brighter and a bit fresher and a bit newer and you don't expect some of the things. They're back at home night before games, uh, sleeping at, ho at home when they play at home at Anfield where Klopp was taken to a hotel. So, again, listen, they don't score your goals, they don't keep your clean sheets, but those are just little things, comfort things. So, I think he's a detailed guy and I think, you know, with, with what we've seen, 
Best defensive record in the league, only two goals conceded. Canate's come back to, to a bit of form and looks a good partner now. Graben Birch has been a revelation, almost like a, a new signing. And I slightly, at this point, and listen, we're, we're seven games in and we've got a break. I think if they can hang in there around Christmas, you know, and, and I know they've got the, 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 the contracts and all that to deal with, I still think they could... Have a say. I'm not going to say at this point they're going to win it, but I just don't think they could be competitive down 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 the stretch just because of the quality. And they've been there, Dan. It's a group of players who've been there. Yeah, I think also as well. One of the word one of the words really I think that that stands out for all of all of these three teams is pressure. Yeah. And when you're talking about pressure, I don't think there's any pressure on Liverpool. No. And yeah, I don't point, say yeah. that, big, you know, they're a massive club, mm. but I don't think anybody thought with the yeah. changing of the management that they were going to be challenging. And I think that in itself probably yeah, allows point, them yeah. to play with a bit more freedom as well. Yeah, it's a really good point, actually. Um, but 1-0 was enough to, to win the game against Palace. Mm. Three points, top of, top of the table. Let's move it on then to Manchester City. 3-2 win against Fulham. Conceded the first goal and then Kovacic's come up with two. Doku gets one before Muniz gets back in the game. I suppose if you're looking for positives from Man City, it's even when they can see, you know, the goals come. Kovacic sitting probably in the Rodri spot, gets a couple of goals. Goals come from different areas of the pitch and they continue to win when not quite at their best. I suppose from a negative point of view, are people starting to think, well, at least you can get goals against them now. They've conceded a few more sloppy goals than maybe we've seen in the past. And I know players, again, still getting up to speed. Um, but City still the team to beat. I actually put Arsenal favourites now. Yeah. And yeah, and the reason I say that, I go back to the Newcastle game mm. and I think it was Fulham's second goal yesterday. Yeah. Look at the specific way that A, the goal from Fulham was scored yesterday, mm. and the one where Oh, was it Gordon that was brought down? Yeah, it was, Gordon, wasn't it? Gordon against yeah, Marseille, yeah. he got run in behind. The keeper brought yeah. him down, yeah. He scored, yeah. Yeah, now, very rarely have you seen Manchester City centre-backs panicking mm. in terms of running back towards their own goal because usually you have the main guy, the best central midfielder yeah. in the world, mm. who sort of that second line of defence just behind the midfield. Yeah. And that, for me, is, is a game-changer, not just because of the gravitas of how unbelievably good he is as a footballer. Yeah. But I think in order to deal with him being out, you have to get two players to do that job. And if you have two players to do that job, then I think it affects you going forward. Yeah. And I just think there's a there's a huge knock on effect mm. there. And you as a you as a midfielder, do you feel as though a player at Manchester City can come in and do the job that Rodri does, or do you think two players are needed to do the job that yeah, Rodri does? Yeah, it's a good question, and we'll, we'll move on after that. Do you know the person who I think, and, I, and I've thrown it out a couple of times, John Stones. Heard it yesterday I don't think when you he can, I don't think he can quite do it in as good a way and as uh, accomplished a way as Rodri, but I just feel he's good in possession, he's good size, he reads danger, he can play forward and, and, and make things happen. Um, we've seen him down the right wing, down the left wing at, at times. I just th wonder whether a John Stones type, I know Rico Lewis has come in, Kovic has started, Gundogan and, and players are, are trying to fill that space. I just think if it was one individual, I, I would probably look at John Stones and, and just think he might have the attributes, like you say, to be that line of defence that City needs. City are always going to score goals. Are they going to be a little bit leaky and might that give op opportunity to other teams? I think it could do. Mm. I, mean, I really do. And I think when, when I talk about the fact of Rodri being out affects them attacking-wise, because we always see Manchester City, they, they cause so many problems for opposition teams yeah. because what they'll do, when they're playing in their you know, traditional 4-3-3, you have Rodri sitting, you have your two outside central midfielders, then go forward. Yeah, It's it's an absolute Fine nightmare top, for a full-back. Yeah. yeah, because what do you, mm. do? do you do? Do you take control of the central midfielder who's coming forward or do you take care of the, the wingers? Plays, yeah. And and what I thought was fascinating was with Guardiola at the start of the season, his wingers were playing like old school wingers, yeah, starting really up, wide yeah. and creating that space. But now I think with Rodri out, I think the dynamics of that attacking side of the team really changed, mm. even though he's one of the best defensive midfielders in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a quick word on, on Arsenal. Went a goal down and we wondered whether against Southampton but came back with, with, with a, uh, a decent win. 
Um, in the end, it, it, the Emirates got the job done and, and stay in, in the hunt. Um, some reason, even when they went, went to goal down, awesome, I always kind of felt like they're going to be okay. I think, there's, for me, there's a, it's a bit more maturity. There's a, ah, don't panic. Well, you know, was it stick to the process and, and, and they'll find a way. And I, I just feel they will. He did tinkle a little bit with the team and have it played a bit of, of an eight and Jesus started up top and Porte played it at right back. Um, I know we've got one of our, our production managers who's a big Arsenal fan and he was sort of like, oh, I don't know why he's tinkering and whatever. And, and listen, they got the job done. We know there's got to be rotation, but um, might that be a little lesson though that, you know, we, you can't take anybody lightly in the Premier League. Can't take anything for granted. No, you you can't, and and I think from Arsenal's side of things, you know, they're a big scalp for any team. Yeah. Um, I think the disappointment of previous seasons, if you want to call it disappointment, where obviously incredible Manchester City teams mm. have hit them at the post. Yeah. I think that's made them stronger. I think it's galvanised them. Um, my concern, and I go back to pressure now. All yeah. of a sudden, I think more people are going to be talking about. Arsenal being favourites, how does that affect the players? And I also think that with Arteta, I love watching him when he's on the touchline. I think at times he covers more miles than some of the players <laughs> on the pitch. Yeah. But but that then, if if you see a manager who looks a little bit nervy, looks a little bit edgy, that then goes onto the pitch as well. Yeah. And I think he has a big role to play in, is in terms of keeping things calm because mm. Arsenal plays, they will have seen it, they will have seen the headlines. All of a sudden you're gonna have you're gonna have people that you're gonna have analysts stepping out and going, Arsenal are favourites now. Mm. And all of a sudden, Arsenal are like, we're not used to being in this position. You know, at, at times it's better to be the chaser than the chased. And that's what Arsenal have been used to for so long, where I think now they're probably looked at by, you know, a large, a large percentage now of being favourites. And it's how they deal with that pressure of potentially being the favourites. Mm. OK, mate, I'm going to take you down to the bottom end of the table um, mm. and just a, a, a quick line across each of the teams. The six teams down there um, from bottom up are Wolves with a point, Southampton with a point, Palace with three, Ipswich with four, Everton with five and Leicester with six. Of the teams down there, mate, pick me the three you would say right now you fear for most. Wolves, Southampton, Palace, Ipswich, Everton or Leicester. OK. Wolves, Southampton, and Leicester. I know Leicester got the three, a win so yesterday. The three, the three teams coming up, who came up, you you think? No, what part? Sorry. Oh, sorry, Wolves. Wolves, Wolves, sorry. Wolves yeah, instead sorry. of Ipswich. My, my bad, Wolves, yeah, Ipswich. Yeah, what, what Wolves instead of Ipswich. Wolves, I think, you know, you can see what, what Gary O'Neill's trying to do. One mm. of the problems last year was that they couldn't score goals. Yeah. So in order to try and score more goals, they've been more expansive. But mm. being more expansive, they're not scoring more goals and they're conceding even more. Yeah. And that that for me, that's that's a recipe that you know doesn't doesn't end well. Southampton, mm. I covered them last Monday against yeah. Bournemouth, uh, when I was in. And there's a stubbornness there, or you can say it's a belief in the philosophy that Russell Martin has. Yeah. But you have to adapt when you when you get promoted. It's as it's as simple as that. And Leicester City, you know, he, You've got Steve Cooper coming in. He came in in the summer. He mm. sees the game very differently than the Moresco, who's now at Chelsea and has started well there. So that's one of the reasons I sort of put them there. They're my three, but you, yeah. you know what it's like. It yeah. can change week to Absolutely. week, depending on managers being at the clubs, players mm. leaving, players coming. What about yourself? Yeah, um, I'm going to go the same, actually, based on, on what you said. I think Wolves is a bad start. Uh, Gary Neville was mm. talking about he did the Wolves game last weekend, and he said they've got like this plan A and don't really go away from it regardless of the game. Sometimes they need to maybe get the ball forward a little bit. You know, we love the build-up. We love Gary O'Neill, but sometimes get it in the box. Similar with Southampton, I think they're caught between, you know, what they want to do in terms of playing, but not quite having the, the players to do it. And I would say of, of the three teams down there, it probably Leicester. I, I just feel that Ipswich might have enough. I quite like the balance of Ipswich and uh, I know they lost it the weekend. Lee, Liam Delap's got four goals yeah. now. That's going to be important that he keeps scoring. Everton, you just feel defensively it, it'll get things right and, and you know, they'll, they'll get goals at the other end. And, and as you say, um, Leicester City and Steve Cooper, um, just not quite sure they're going to make. Palace is the other one down there. It's, uh, it's a bit of a game. I think it's Palace Forest when we come back. It's an interesting one. Wouldn't want to see okay. uh, Palace losing that one all of a sudden. You know, Glasner did such great work last season. 
um, not quite going so well this. All right, mate, we're going to wrap things up with just a, a mm. quick one before the international break. So I'm just going to ask you, like, it, look down the league and tell me who's been seven games in, who's been a bit of a surprise for you? Who, who's played or performed in a way that, that's just caught your eye? I'm going to go with, and people might say, well, it shouldn't be a surprise yeah. because of the money they've spent, mm. but I'm going to go with Chelsea. Yeah, I'm going to go with sure. Chelsea just because yeah. of the, because of the simple fact, you know, I think for large stretches last season, you looked at them as a team and you were like, there's something here, but they're missing the experienced players. Yeah. When in all reality, maybe they were just missing a manager that could come in and put them in a position to succeed. And that's what they've done now defensively. You never knew what you were going to get from Chelsea last year. They could win 5-1 or they could lose mm. 5-1. Now they've got this... They've got this stronger defence which they can build on, this disciplined defence. And they are looking they're looking really good. And after the international break, they go to Anfield, don't they? Yeah, that's right. They go to Liverpool on the Sunday. That, that's the big game. That, yeah. That, it's a test. That'll be it? that'll be be a really, really good test. But I yeah. think that, that they're looking like a team now that everybody thought potentially they could be. They've gone, as we talk about Manchester United, mm. they've gone from a team of young individuals now to a collective and they're looking really good, looking really well balanced. You know, so I, I've been I've been impressed with them. Yeah. What about yourself? Well, I'm going to tip my hat to Nottingham Forest and Nuno, 10th in the league, mm -hmm. um, started better than I had them as possibly one of the teams who might struggle a bit like Wolves. I'm going to tip my hat to Brighton and Fabian Hertzler with what they've done and great win against Spurs today, comeback win from 2-0 from down. But my surprise team this season is Fulham and Marco Silva. Um, didn't spend an awful lot of money. Marco Silva, you know, I think is, a, is an excellent coach. They've lost some some players along the way. I think Smith Rowe's been good business. I think he was on the bench, started on the bench. He's getting a tune out of Traore. Raul Jimenez is, 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 is back in form. Uh, Anderson was a good buy. I think with Bassi, he looks Very like good. he's sort, sort in the back line. So Marco Silva and Fulham, they don't often get much headlines. We don't often see them on, you know, big NBC and, and games. But Fulham have just quietly gone about their business really well and I think they've had a real decent start after after seven games they sit eighth in the Premier League 11 points uh three above Manchester United and that's got to be seen as a decent start and give them a base to make sure they're comfortable again staying in the Premier League listen mate we're going to wrap things up here mm -hmm. um obviously we just want to have a, uh, a chat across the league uh, this takes us to the end of match week seven as we head into the international break at the top Man City Arsenal and Liverpool all won while all not probably been at the best. The focus was at Villa Park. It was Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag. They did enough. They got a nil-nil draw to ease some of the pressure on the manager. And we're going to take an international break for next week. So we'll be back the following Sunday, October the 20th, when that big game we've talked about it, Liverpool face Chelsea. Good test for both those teams. But for now, I'm Earl, he's Higginbottom. Together we're a new version of Two Robbies. Thanks for watching and listening. Be safe, stay healthy. It's a good night from me. It's a good night from him. Good night. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host of NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. And if you want even more Premier League content from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock.